Hello, my name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I am a Associate Professor of Philosophy at Providence College. This here is a lecture uh, on David Schweikert's After Capitalism, and I will be looking particularly at Chapter 1 in this lecture, and there will be more lectures that follow after this one. So to overview the lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the text to introduce it, and then we will get into the features of capitalism, the counter project, the successor system theory, the criteria for such a theory, uh, how revolution works today, and then we will talk a little bit about gender and have a note on historical materialism. So to begin. Uh, the text is authored by David Schweikert, who is a professor of philosophy at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, it's important to note that uh, David uh, went uh, had a PhD in math and then transferred uh, to philosophy and there did a PhD, uh, PhD there in philosophy. And he was particularly drawn to Marx and uh, Marx's political economy. And his math uh, background gave him a nice background from which to understand Marx. The book itself does not have a lot of mathematics in it. As far, uh, so far, it has had no mathematics in it. Uh, but it does uh, give David an opportunity to uh, explain certain concepts with, uh, from Marx uh, with uh, easier to understand language. The text itself is, uh, as David says, uh, the fourth uh, version of this text. The one that I am reading is the second edition of After Capitalism. Uh, but he says this really originated with his uh, PhD thesis in uh, philosophy that got turned into one book, and then that book led to this book. Uh, what he's looking at is uh, the shortcomings of capitalism and a desirable alternative to capitalism. And this alternative is one that he calls uh, economic democracy. And so that's really what we're going to be looking at uh, throughout the book in these lectures. Now, if we're going to look at capitalism, we really want to understand what capitalism is. And so David provides four features of capitalism. And those features are a consumer society, global financial markets, savage inequality, and the irrationality of the system. So when we talk about consumer society, that's fairly simple. It's the idea that uh, society is based around consumption, that we spend most of our lives consuming things, and in fact that our lives in the modern world uh, must be focused on consumption, uh, partly because that's how we satisfy our basic needs. Um, in relationship to this, uh, David says that the great temples to the spirit, shopping malls that dwarf in size and attendance, cathedrals and mosques of earlier epics. I think this really captures uh, for David and for us this uh, very... Uh, religious element of consumerism today. It has become uh, a cult, uh, and we want to keep that in mind as we think about what co the consumer society is. The second feature of capitalism is the global financial ma markets. And so here we're not just talking about globalization, but the way that financial markets themselves have become globalized and have taken over uh, the way that uh, economics and societies uh, generate profits and the things that they need. Uh, here, again, David makes uh, a religious uh, image. So he says that there is a hierarchy of priests, uh, including financial advisors, brokers, bankers, traders, journalists, and economists that serve the sub-deities of currencies, commodities, stocks, and bonds. Uh, he was writing this 15 years ago, uh, right after, the, well, originally he wrote it before the uh, economic crisis of 2007, but then he revised it after 2007. We're living in, in 2020 at this point, and we really see this uh, idea of these sub deities of stocks and bonds because the market is considered to be doing well, uh, even though people are working uh, low-end jobs uh, or part-time jobs, precarious jobs. But the market is considered to be uh, really strong at this point. Savage inequality is a third feature of capitalism. Uh, again, David is looking at uh, older data uh, because he wrote this a few years ago. Uh, so he's talking about 
2007, where the 500 wealthiest people uh, in America owned uh, equivalent to the 60% 60 60 of the poorest people uh, in the world. And this is a significant uh, number right there. But if you look at today, uh, 2020, the 26 wealthiest individuals uh, own the equivalent of 50% of the poorest people in the world. And that's a fascinating, uh, even staggering growth in inequality. But inequality is not simply the, the issue here. It's that this inequality is savage. It makes life uh, almost unbearably, <clears throat> unbearably hard. It makes the conditions of the poor uh, really uh, terrible. And then the fourth feature of capitalism is this irrationality of the system itself. Uh, and so we like to think that capitalism is a system that helps us to organize our lives, uh, perhaps through the invisible hand of the market, in the words of Adam Smith. But in fact, the system is itself irrational. And so uh, Davis Fyford asks, how can it be that the amazing technologies we have developed tend to intensify, not lessen the pace of work, and make our jobs and lives less? not more secure. And again, we can think about uh, the financial markets and the consumer society and the savage inequality. And even though the market looks like it's good because of the stock and bonds, uh, the inequality makes people's lives uh, precarious, less secure. And in fact, we have such technologies that we can reduce the work week, uh, but instead what we see is people are, are working more and more. Now, if there are problems with capitalism, what uh, Schweikert wants to propose is a counter-project. And here he's talking about uh, a, his history of different protests and different projects uh, against this kind of overwhelming capitalism. Uh, so one feature of the counter-project is that it opposes the project of globalizing capital. And this really had its uh, spark with the 1999 protest in Seattle against the World Trade Organization. Uh, and that has, of course, sparked other uh, pro uh, protests since then, and we can think most obviously of the Occupy movement, but there are other movements that we can think about, including the Arab Spring and the No Dapple protests. And so what Schweikert is looking for here is a dialectical synthesis of these protests. protests. We can't focus on just one, but the fact that there are so many, and how do we bring them together? And the, the idea that the dialectic is that there's a way to synthesize the different things that people are protesting against, which becomes this counter project. And so it's not a nihilism that we're looking for, but a socialism. So we're not trying to wipe out the things that are good in our society. What we're trying to do is build on those things. And that includes liberty and democracy and the rule of law. And to do so uh, through the virtues of generosity, solidarity, and human creativity. And so if he wants to summarize the counter project as all people everywhere who are working to overcome structural oppressions are participating in a common project. So you might be fighting racism where you are or, or sexism or some kind of uh, hyper masculinity, but there's a, a unity to all of these things where we can bring the protest together and really fight the oppression that's structural within uh, capitalism. In order to do this, though, we need a successor system uh, to uh, capitalism. So what he's really talking about here is what is our vision for what comes after capitalism? What, what succeeds uh, capitalism? And he says this vision has to have some degree of precision and has to have a, an economic order beyond capitalism. It's something that uh, opposes what many people say is our best theory so far, which is capitalism. How do we make an answer to the charge that capitalism is the best that we can get. And in order to do this, it has to have the precision necessary to make people convinced that we can make this world come about. Now, the criteria for this successor system uh, is, uh, first, that the economic model be something that can be defended both to professionals and ordinary citizens. A Schweikert is not interested in talking just to professionals. He's not interested in talking just to citizens. He wants to br bring a conversation together where we can defend our ideas uh, both to the professionals and to ordinary citizens and convince them that the successor theory is stronger than capitalism. Uh, second, it has to make sense of the kinds of economic experiments that the last centuries have witnessed. Uh, 
Schweikert will focus on the Mondragon experiment, but there are other experiments in different parts of the world where we try to make a, uh, an economic system uh, superior to uh, capitalism, and he's going to build on those. Third, we want to clarify the various progressive economic reforms and suggest even more. So there have been attempts to uh, have economic reforms that are progressive, and we want to build on those and even suggest more of them. Fourth, we want to envisage uh, a transition from capitalism. So, so many times I hear people say, particularly students say, that uh, we can't change the world. It's just going to have to burn, and then we'll build something new. And what I think is interesting about Schweikert's proposal is he's saying, no, we have to think about how we move from here to there without that collapse. How do we make these small steps so that we come to something beyond capitalism? And then finally, we just want to remember that the counter project is larger than just the economic project, uh, but David is fo focusing on this economic project in this particular book. What we're looking for then is a revolution, but a revolution that's different from uh, previous revolutions. So the old models, the French, the Russian, the Chinese, the Cuban, the violent revolutions are no longer appropriate today. What we're looking for is something that's going to be more democratic, that comes about through democratic means. In order to have this, the vision has to be concrete and it has to provide structural alternatives to what we have seen in the past. And again, the uh, need for reform struggles now uh, has to be part of this uh, socioeconomic transformation. How do we reform uh, issues in racism and classism uh, and how do those all come together in this social economic transformation? For this, we're going to need a variety of strategies and aims uh, because the transition will be in various places. It will be uh, you know, one way in the United Kingdom and another way in the United States and another way in uh, wherever we might go to next. And finally, even though it is going to require different strategies th uh, in throughout the world, we're not looking for a political party, but we are looking for an international social movement based in changing our consciousness so that we recognize not only the problems with capitalism, but that there is something better out there that we can build. Now, David does not spend a lot of time on gender in his book, uh, but there are parts of gender that he wants to think about in building uh, his uh, theory and in thinking about how to address the problems with capitalism. So one thing that gender has helped us to see is that ethics is more about uh, more than just about values, right? It's a capacity for moral reasoning. It's a self-identity. And we can even think about the ethic of care as a, a, a fundamental correction to uh, this uh, invisible hand of the market. Uh, second, we also want to recognize that poverty affects uh, uh, women more than it does men because of the sexual division of labor. A third, we want, want to recognize that women are more uh, overworked than men, uh, not only in the workplace, but also typically in the home where they do more work than uh, men typically do. But as we think about what the successor system looks like and we think about communities and what those look like, we want to recognize that women have provided a variety of insights into how to redesign these communities and make them better, uh, insights that men have missed before. And that's true for democracy, too. How do we understand democracy and the feminist contributions to that? And that leads us again to revolution. Uh, women have played significant roles in all revolutions, and more importantly, they offer a different model uh, that avoids the worst excesses of revolution marked by masculinity. And as we try to find something that is more democratic, we're going to need to rely on feminist uh, perspectives and women perspectives on changing society. And finally, we want to end with a note about historical materialism. So as David uh, remarks, historical materialism is just the theory that history evolves through the way that human beings produce the material needs, uh, the material goods that satisfy their needs. Uh, and this is the idea that, that uh, human history exhibits a directional intelligibility that we can call product, progress, and we as a species are gaining ever more conscious control over our world. So the materialism here is not about God, it's about economics. And importantly, materialism requires a philosophy of hope. 
And I think that is central to building the successor theory because 